Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I think this is my third, third or fourth next. It's, it's wonderful to be back, and I actually love this theater. I, the, the team here always presents a great experience for, uh, for attendees and speakers alike. So you've heard a lot about great products, great UX, great design. You've seen glimpses of the future. One of the things that I had to do over the last several years to see the future was to go backwards. We use the word experience like the way we use the words innovation or disruption to the point where I'm not even sure if any of us could actually tell the other person next to you what an experience really is. When I was writing this book, which was about experience design in a digital, a digital economy, I felt, wow, this is incredibly ironic, writing a book about designing experiences in a digital economy. So I spent the last several years asking myself, well, what, what could a book experience be in 2016? And I looked at teenagers, high school teenagers, who still have to use textbooks when they do homework. To use that as my inspiration to say, there is no possible way a teenage brain can even comprehend a textbook the way that we had to comprehend a textbook back in the Middle Ages. So what could you do to learn from all of their favorite apps, all of the UI from the favorite apps, what they share, what they don't share, and reverse engineer that to paper. So I call this book an analog app. And the insights around that were great. For example, there's no need for a table of contents because our brain doesn't work linear anymore. And all of the great apps that you use, all of the great networks that you use are actually reprogramming your brains. And so when you think about experience design, whether it's for a product or for a brand or for a service or for an app, you actually have to start with what an experience is and what it means to someone who isn't you. And that's where things just started to blow my mind. An experience that is valuable to someone other than you. Because then you start to learn words like empathy and relevance, where someone else might value other things and how you value. And the only way to understand that is to step outside of all of the psychological boundaries that we put around ourselves when we approach creativity, when we approach strategy. The great irony as well is telling you about experience design using PowerPoint slides. So we'll just have to make do. One of the most fascinating things that we see with disruption today is that it has everything to do with missing how behavior is changing, missing how people change, how preferences, behaviors, values, cultures, norms, how those things change. Because we get so stuck in processes that we surround ourselves with safety. But I actually think that it is absolutely easy to forget the people on the other side of the screen, that there are real people who use our work. And we have to bring them into our work in order to truly innovate. Because what happens if we're not innovating, we are doing what I call iteration, which is doing the same things better. So for example, when you see virtual reality or augmented reality or artificial intelligence, all of the applications that you see today are just basically iteration, doing the same things better or differently. But what if you could actually do things that create new value? That's innovation. And when you can create new things that make the old things obsolete, that's disruption. One of the hardest things that I had to figure out while writing this book was defining the word experience. What is an experience? It turns out that at a very basic level, it is just something you feel. And it's measured in how you react. So if I design a home screen, if I create a package for a product that you buy, if you call customer service, if you talk to a sales representative, if you go to a website, those are all experiences that you have, and you have emotional reactions to them. The thing about experience, I think, is that we have to define what it is you should feel, what it is you should do, 
And it should be consistent against that architecture, against that vision, in every moment of truth. Because what has happened is that we have these ideas, we have these products, and we sell them to you, we brand them, we market them, we tell you that this is what it's supposed to feel like. But that's not a real experience. That's just branding and marketing. You will react. We all react. And that creates what I call an experience divide. Today, we do not actively design the experiences we want people to have and share. We tell you what to think. But now that we're all connected, now that we're all informed, that doesn't work anymore. All the biggest analyst firms in the world are saying, no matter what product category you're in, no matter what size your company is, you are now, over the next 10 years, going to compete at a level of customer experience. So there we go again, using that word experience. Well, what does customer experience even mean? If you want to think bigger and you want to think differently, it is the experience that people have in every touch point, in every moment of truth, and how that comes together is the sum of that customer experience. If one part is fantastic and another part sucks, well, then that's not a great customer experience. Because once you taste a good experience, regardless of industry, it becomes the standard. So for those who have used Uber, and I know they're having challenges here in Germany, the UI, the invisibility of the payment system, the reviews, just the architecture of the entire system puts you at a different expectation level. So around the world, people are starting to say, well, where's my Uber of banks? Where's my Uber of dentists and doctors? Because Uber now starts to change your expectation from an experiential standpoint. We could talk about UI, we could talk about services, we could talk about products, but at the end of the day, the experience of Uber is now something that you come to expect, to the point where I've studied how long is too long to wait for an Uber before you open Lyft, for example. In New York, that number is four minutes. If you open Uber and it's going to take four minutes for a car to come to you, you think that's too long, so you open Lyft. Because what happened in our life where four minutes to wait for a car to come to you where you're standing was suddenly too much difficulty for you? Because psychologically and subconsciously, we just start to change. And so I work with businesses of all sizes, and the one thing that I always hear is this, but we can't do that. We'll never get approval for that. The lawyers won't let that happen. But we can't innovate if we don't try something new. We can't lead the way if we can't have people follow us. And so I ask you as developers, as designers, as strategists, whatever you do, stop and take a step back and think about those experiences in your life that defined you, that you still hold on to, that you remember to this day, because those are the elements that you're now supposed to replicate or design or deliver for someone else. And that's where experience starts. And the hardest part is breaking out of these routines, breaking out of these processes that we hold so sacred, starting to break away from the metrics of success that we hold as standard, even though that they were defined yesterday. So part of this is learning something new. I think the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity is unlearning those processes, unlearning those standards, unlearning those metrics as a way of seeing things differently, because that's where true innovation starts. It's the ability to see what doesn't work, or what's broken, or what could be better, and using those as points of inspiration to design something more meaningful, more purposeful, something that's less iterative. Because I think too many of us confuse the words iteration and innovation. I think when we think we're innovating, we're actually iterating. And that's where all of this begins is a shift in perspective, how you see things versus what we see things differently as. That's one of the greatest challenges I see just personally, by the way. We tend to see the world as we are, not as it is. And as a result, we judge it. 
We judge it when it's different than our beliefs. We argue with it as a way of substantiating our beliefs rather than seeing it for what it is or what it could be. Innovation starts with seeing things differently, hearing things differently, feeling it differently, and then taking action accordingly. Because the people we're designing for, is, they're really not us. This is an art series where the photographer photoshops out the phone from everyday scenarios so that we can actually see how deeply ingrained technology is in our life. Right, some of you wake up this way, some of you go to sleep this way, some of you go to the bathroom this way. That's why we now live in an ecosystem. Apps like Uber, all of these services, social networks, they are all teaching us that we are the most important person in the world. Just think about when you post something on Facebook and you do not get a reaction from your friends. You feel bad. Why didn't everybody like that picture of my dinner? So now you think you have to share again because you need that validation. All of these apps are turning us into what I call accidental narcissists. Instead of judging it, we have to now think about how do we design for it? And how do we design for it in a very productive and useful way? Because we're not going to change it. And at the same time, the more we look at our phones or the more we look at our devices or the more we start to wear whatever's next, we become digital introverts. It is actually difficult for us to think about calling someone. And yet, most businesses around the world make you call them if you have a problem. And they're now thinking about putting artificial intelligence in those call centers to further automate the stuff that you have to deal with today. I don't think anybody looks forward to calling customer service to the point where there's an app in Los Angeles called At Service, which is basically the Uber of calling customer service for you so you don't have to do it. Again, catering to the accidental narcissist. Because the way the world is versus the way we see the world is different. And I think once we start to let this sink in, we can now start to design differently. Our first reaction, especially if you're a certain age in this room, is to look at that and say, that's exactly what's wrong with the world. Nobody can look up. No one could look each other in the eyes. This is what parties have begun. But, but to them, it is the best party ever. They are totally telling all their friends that right now. So then, rather than judge it, how do we use something like this for inspiration, to see it differently, to be able to design something so engaging that they have to use it, to create those experience hooks, those design objects, those social objects, to change the way people live life? I want this in every airport, just saying. But that's the reality of this world. We're not going to change it, we just have to design it. And we have to steer it, and we have to shape it in ways that are more productive. And that starts with understanding that Maslow's hierarchies of needs have changed. A bunch of you are probably looking at your batteries right now saying, why aren't there outlets near all of these seats? Because of whatever percentage you're at, am I going to make it through the day? My friend backstage has a battery this big for his laptop and his phone. It's just a reality, right? <laughs> this is a real picture. <laughs> because who doesn't take their VR goggles to have lunch? <laughs> All of these screens require experience architecture. All of these applications require experience architecture. Even physical products require experience architecture because we're changing our brains as we live life. It's not just about kids, it's anybody who lives a digital lifestyle. You look at your phones probably 1,500 times a week, that adds up to about 177 minutes per day. You're getting used to gestures and behaviors, of course, but you're also being programmed to expect things faster. You're expecting things more personal, and you are constantly checking your notifications or your favorite apps for all kinds of deep-rooted validation motivation, inspiration, information. These are all new elements that we have to take into consideration when we design. There are human beings on the other side of the screen, and they are different than how we assume customers or users behave. 
So I ask you as a strategist, as a designer, as a developer, to think about this. Today, if you think about how you buy a car, or how you download an app, or how you buy music, or stream music, you have to go through these processes that exist and have existed for decades. And so we expect people to conform to our processes rather than us conforming to how they're living life. Because how they're living life becomes intuitive, it becomes normal, and once they have a taste of that, it is their standard. And so the more they have to have an experience divide in order to do business with us, that starts to become more and more foreign, less intuitive, less desirable, outmoded, dated, old. And so we have to think now about designing for the way people live. And there are so many places where we can start. We haven't even had a productive conversation about what the point of a website is since 1995. We just keep putting more stuff on it. Today, we have to make it responsive so it works on mobile screens. But what is someone even trying to find or look for? Have we reimagined how to design a website experience, let alone great products or apps? Thinking about design from purpose or intent or context rather than just trying to stuff everything in there, not thinking about the user experience, not thinking about the experience in general. I mean, look how long it's taken us to have meaningful conversations about remote controls. And that's because a lot of us grew up at a time when we were taught that you just do things this way. This is the way it's always been. This is tradition. This is the way we do it. Don't ask questions. Don't raise a fuss. Just do it. And you're measured for just following the rules. So we didn't question. Yet nobody in this room likes their remote control. We all have reluctant relationships with them. And over the years, this has become a metaphor for how I think about iteration versus innovation. The remote control is an example of iteration. We just keep putting more stuff into existing paradigms and existing processes to the point where on average, because I studied this, there are 70 buttons on today's remote control. That is ridiculous. Right? The next generation iPhone is supposedly not even going to have a home button. And we still have to click 70 different buttons to watch television. So I get it. We can't do things differently unless we challenge ourselves to operate differently. And when we go back to work, we're going to be stuck in meetings, we're going to be stuck in inboxes, yet we're supposed to find time to do things differently, to think differently. And I think about it this way. We have to define the experience. We can't just talk about the company or the brand or the mission. We have to actually define what is that human emotion I want you to feel? Is it aspirational? Is it productive? What are your challenges? What are your goals? And I have to understand all of those things so I can design meaningful experiences because that is the brand experience. I shouldn't have to lie to you or market to you just to make you like something. It should be that something. And so it changes the entire premise of how we go to market and how we serve customers and users. So once you design that brand experience, then we design the customer experience. What is that customer journey? What are those touch points? What are every element of, of those things, how are those going to bring the experience to life the way we designed it? And then how are we going to design every aspect of that customer experience from the journey to the product usage? Because in the end, that becomes the brand. The experiences that people have, and more importantly, the experiences that people share is the brand. So why would we leave experiences to chance? Why would I leave it to chance of how you're going to feel or what you're going to do? We shouldn't. This is an opportunity for innovation and design because every aspect of that touch point, whether it's the web, whether it's a store, whether it's a representative, email, you name it, tied around a greater ecosystem of just product experience, how we use it, what we like, what we don't like, when we need help, all of those things 
are now supposed to work together. Because once they work together, you now have a brand experience, a customer experience, and a user experience all in alignment in every touch point to create a better brand and, a more importantly, a better customer relationship, which means that your job is now more important and bigger than it was yesterday. Because today, all of these things are handled by different people within your company, yet people don't see all of those departments, all of those politics, all of those egos, all of the challenges in your culture. They just see one company. And so this is our path to doing the right thing by designing what those experiences should be, defining what those experiences should be, what people feel, what people do, what people share. Just like the way Walt Disney designed Disneyland originally. Every aspect of that park was designed to create one whole experience and then individual experiences all the way down to the trash cans, to the pavement on the floor, to the building facades, to the bricks, to the point where that led to the art of storyboarding in order to tell better stories, to design better movies, to the point where Airbnb brought in a Pixar artist to help them storyboard, to help them understand their users, to help them understand their hosts in order to design a better experience for hosts and for guests to deliver against the new Airbnb brand. So where to start? First, you have to fix the fundamentals. There are things inside of your organization that are just broken. Inside of your product, your overall experience, your customer journey, there are so many places that you can start to fix. Then start eliminating friction. Things like websites, things like contact centers. There are so many elements within the organization that are broken. But then you can now start to think about how to differentiate, how to compete better how to compete for brand, user, and customer experience. And then lastly, look at other industries. Don't look at your competitors. They'll hold you back. Look at people outside of your industry for inspiration. And look at the people who you're trying to sell to. Not just the people you sell to today, but the people you do not sell to or market to today. Because that's what matters most. And I promise you, you don't know them as well as you think you do because there is no one audience, there is no one market. We don't just have to listen to the highest paid person in the room anymore. We have to listen to the things that drive empathy because that inspires innovation. Because in the end, things like brand and loyalty and advocacy, those are the byproducts of meaningful and personal experiences. And those experiences have to be designed. And that design has to start with you. If it doesn't start with you, who's going to lead it? If we're waiting for someone to tell us what to do differently, we're on the wrong side of innovation. The way I approached this book and the way I ask you to approach your work is just hold no assumptions, make no assumptions. Learn and unlearn and start with a blank canvas. Experience architecture is art and science and we should learn how to paint or draw or create or design for a different economy, a different generation. This is space. This is the way I think about things. This is experience in terms of how you feel and what you do. And it's yours to design. Thank you. <laughs>